In the day and age of the modern internet, there's a lot of conversation around free speech and what should or should not be permissible as far as the internet is concerned. What should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed, and a lot of times this gets brought up on my channel and it's something that I'm deeply passionate about and I, I want to talk about it. Now, recently, I actually talked about this uh, decently extensively on my Sunday coffee live stream where I go and I respond to your comments. And now after that went down, one of my subscribers who is, well, just fantastic, came on and put quite a long comment on the live stream after it was down. And I read through partially what they said, and I thought, you know what, there's a lot of good points here that I would love to address in regards to the free speech on the internet. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special episode. We're gonna be getting into the topics, the differences, some things that Jordan B. Peterson has talked about, things that maybe uh, Pokimane also talked about, and versus free speech in the First Amendment, and the pluses and minuses, and the controversies, and the uh, uh, contrivances of uh, uh, and the contradictions that seem to be around the free speech around the internet. So without any further ado, Horizon Talker. And this is well laid out. If I go hard in on this at all, it's not because I'm going hard in on Horizon Talker. It's because I get very, very passionate about what I'm talking about when I'm talking about it. Now, with all the news of the day, I could have talked about many things. I could have talked about Jeremy Renner. I could have talked about the TikTok stuff. I could have talked about the Elon versus Fauci stuff. And you know what? None of those seem to be as important to me as what Horizon Talker brought up on my live stream. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm still getting over a little bit of a cold. So, just rewatched the stream. What I find interesting on the whole Jordan B. Peterson debate is that I think his uh, psychology brain has identified a contradiction in our thought processes that put our culture uh, that put our culture needs to deal process that our culture sorry that our culture needs. Uh, to deal with, but he can't articulate it well. It's funny because Royce actually presents this contradiction in this video, although not to the full extent that I've noticed in other places. I was like, wait a minute, what contradiction? Early on, he states that he doesn't think we should do away with anonymity online. Later, he repeatedly stresses that doxing is not illegal and all your information is out there already. These two statements are at odds. They actually are not at odds, okay? And this is where, all right, the rights of the individuals come in. But let's finish this before I before I dive in on that. Uh, we've got a statement that no one should know who you are unless you want them to, and a statement that everyone already knows who you are. Not intrinsically in those two statements, no. And only if you try to look at it on its face value. So let's attack the first one here, okay? Uh, he states that he doesn't think we should do away with anonymity online. Absolutely not. So anonymity online is like a lock for an honest man, right? The anonymity that you have online in order to somewhat keep some of the things that you're saying discreet, maybe from your employers or maybe from some crazy family members that you have. I have them. I actually have uh, a niece of mine tried to dox my wife, interestingly enough. Uh, but I mean, all of our information's on Google. Like you can literally search our information. So... But when it comes to anonymity online, that is your right as an individual to put your name out there online for in somewhat of a public square, public forum, or what you could consider a pen name, right? Now, pen names or pseudonames that people have used to write books and letters and poems for, for many, many years, for centuries, right? It's similar to that. You have the right to use an alternate name when you are speaking in certain terms, okay? Later, this is, goes down to the rights of the individual. Later, he repeatedly stresses that doxing is not illegal and all your information is already out there. True, if you involve 
okay another party in your personal information such as the post office such as the bank of you know being your mortgage company such as the federal government to any level and in this day and age it's next to impossible such as sending a letter to anybody out there using the postal service right Okay, anytime that you put your information out there, okay, it goes into public record in more ways than you can possibly imagine. There are so many ways to find out a person, who they are, where they live, all this stuff, and it literally it takes about a five minute Google search. The sad fact of the reality is that's where it's at, okay? The two statements that online anonymity, okay, somebody who is essentially putting a lock you know, a, a small lock on their door to keep the honest people and the vicious people away from them won't keep the honest and vicious people out. Now, like burglars, burglary is obviously a bad thing and legally a bad thing because that robs the rights of the individual. Now, the only way that doxing to the extent where it could potentially be considered illegal is if the doxed information is used to cause harm to another person and literally pull their rights away from them, okay? But doxing, releasing the information of that individual is not necessarily illegal because you have already included many, 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 many different parties in your personal information and your whereabouts, okay? So those two things are not at odds. One is when you're writing something online to somewhat keep your anonymity as far maybe away from your bosses or from, um, you know, family members that are crazy, things like that. A way to go online, say what you want to say, and really for those people who aren't looking and really trying to search out and maybe not to connect your name necessarily to your business. Now, if somebody went out there, they dox you, and those repercussions happen, that is something that happens. But again, these two things are not at odds. Again, you have done both things. One, you've created, I've created a drink with crazy. Now my real name is out there. But a drink with crazy online is something that, you know, like my bosses don't even know that I have a YouTube channel. I don't really talk to them about it. I tell them I kind of do like a little, you know, like podcasty type stuff, but I don't go out and I don't really talk about it because I keep my work life and my personal life somewhat separated in the regards of social interaction, right? And that's part of the reason that anonymity online can be very important is keeping work and personal and maybe even, I guess in this case, your online li online life separate from those things, right? So online anonymity can be very, very important. As far as doxing is concerned, okay, simply finding public information that is readily available online in multiple places and sharing it to a platform does not mean anything. Again, the information is already out there and it is out there and posted by governmental sources, okay? So if we're going to make doxing illegal, then we need to make it illegal for the government to post these sources. Now, the government will never vote to restrict any of their power or any of their ability to reduce what they can subject their populations to, okay? Most people function just fine with that kind of dual-mindedness. I hope that I've cleared up a little bit that I don't actually share this dual mindedness there. Again, as somebody who likes to keep my personal life somewhat separated from my professional life and that I don't talk about the things that I do, you know, extensively, you know, you get to the people ask, oh, how was your weekend? Well, we had a good weekend. We played some video games with the kids. We did things like that, but I don't need to go into further detail about other things that I might be doing to maybe try to build a business, you know, that I can work from home one day, such as my YouTube, right? Because when your company goes, oh, wait, wait a minute, you don't like it here? Well, no, I do like it here, but I'd like to work for myself. That might not necessarily be a good thing, right? Most people function just fine with that kind of dual mindedness. However, a psychologist is, in theory, although rarely in practice, uh, supposed to help you identify and cope with contradictions in your thinking that may be handicapping you in some way. But that 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 could be something that a psychologist does. Uh, not not necessarily uh, true. Uh, it depends on the psychologist that you talk to. Uh, I have uh, my wife and I have friends of ours. Uh, and they're psychologists, and they all have slightly different approaches, which is what I think Peterson has done, okay? What he hasn't done is present it in a way that shows he is aware of the shortcomings that the contradiction is creating. Again, there is no contradiction here, okay? There's the, the idea that online anonymity, 
okay? And the idea of doxing, right, where one is not illegal and the other should be permissible, they're not contradictions in and of themselves, right? The idea that you can write a book and not use your real name, all right, is writing anonymously. Now, if you intend to get rid of online anonymity, you have to follow that to the logical conclusion. You are no longer allowed to do anything under a false name, period. It must be your real name all the time without exception, okay? If we're going to go there, we need to take it to the logical extreme. Again, I don't think that's true at all. There are social repercussions for people you know, saying things online, potentially, right? Depending on where they live. Now, where I live and a lot of the things that I say, my employer, most of those people aren't really going to care, especially because, well, I've talked to them about a lot of my opinions and I'm like, here's where I stand, just so you know. And they go, okay, cool, right? But a lot of people might live in areas where they do have social opinions that using the anonymous name online can help them get out those opinions and form bonds through different communities online. Again, all of their social, all, all of their, you know, legal information, address, I mean, hell, even date of birth and stuff like that, you can find online and most of it is posted on government websites, okay? So there isn't a contradiction here, okay? That's understandable. I'm not sure I can point to all the shortcomings and the benefits of either of these uh, points of view, much less what kinds of hurdles uh, trying to hold both viewpoints at once creates. Again, if you think about the rights of an individual, the right of the individual has the right to speak freely, okay? They have the right to speak and say their mind, whether under their real name or not under their real name. However, as an individual as well, if you share your address with a, uh, again, a federal entity, a state entity, a mailing entity, a business entity, right? You want to get that box that all these companies, are, oh, just give us your information and we'll you know, send you a box every month and we'll mail it to you and the post offices have it. And by the way, the public registry has your address, where you live, who's on your mortgage, all of these things, all of these things are there. You are doing one, you are doing both, right? You want to be anonymous online to maybe say some stuff because you don't want the people socially in your life to know, you know, maybe, maybe you have different political opinions than them. And you don't want them to hear that and that to affect maybe your day job, right? However, you also have to understand that people willingly and have willingly given up their private residence and their information for decades and decades and decades, okay? So you have to understand that the doxing thing, finding publicly available information and posting it online, although it might be a dick move, it is not necessarily illegal because, again, they're not using... Now, if they use illegal methods to obtain that information, that's a different story, right? But you, as an individual, have a right to keep your name off of your social media account and speak the way that you want to, falling under free speech laws. What I do know is that we are currently struggling over the right place of the internet. Uh, over the right place of the internet is in our culture. Uh, is it a public square? It is, a, is it a hallway of private clubs we can go into so long as we conform to the rules of the clubs? Is it a bunch of private clubs? Is it acceptable for a free society to have <coughs> some or all of its decision, uh, its decisions on government? Uh, governance and public life made in those private clubs uh, where many people who are not uh, acceptable for membership will be kept out and may uh, of the decision makers never have to say who they are or what their agendas are. What becomes of our society if it's more powerful, uh, if it's most powerful tool of expression and commerce is also the most powerful tool of enforcing conformity or are they always the same thing? See, and that really gets into the social aspect of this, right? Social enforcement is something that Jordan Peterson talks about quite extensively in a lot of his longer form um, speeches that he does. 
And one of the things that the the internet has shown us is that there, when you give people the power to socially enforce the things that they want, they will do it in mass. And not only that, but many people will take it to duplicitous means, right? They will use that social enforcement for destructive purposes. Now, this gets into the free speech idea behind slander, defamation, and the good old thing, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, when it if its most powerful tool of expression and commerce is also the most powerful tool of enforcing conformity. In many senses, right, that has kind of always been the way, right? And it always goes back into the place that society engages in, okay? Going back, you know, oh, 75 to 80 years from now, there was a lot, and I mean a lot, of segregation in this country, right? The segregation wasn't necessarily enforced 100%. It was enforced a lot by the governments, but even after the government lied and said that, you know, we got rid of segregation, a lot of social pressure was put on a ton of people in order to conform to the rules of that particular area that they lived in. The difference here is that the internet in and of itself has eviscerated okay, the geographic community, right? The close-knit geographic communities, and it has expanded it into a worldwide community, which I would argue is potentially hazardous uh, to the... Mm, to the human expression and to the way that humans think and interact. Once we went from knowing people in a town of 500 or even a couple thousand, where the decisions that you made in life really affected you there, to where the decisions that you make in life, nobody in that town of 2000 may know about, but millions of people across the planet could know. We are now interacting on the grand stage of the world, right? And everybody who interacts through things such as Facebook and Twitter and TikTok, which is currently being banned uh, for our military here in the US, all of these things out there, when people put them out there like that, you're no longer really engaging in a small, tight-knit group in society. You're engaging with millions upon millions of people across the world. Okay. Conversely, if the internet is a series of private clubs with their own rules to use them, does this mean we are finally willing to assert standards for other people and hold them to account for failure? That would be a useful development in my book. What does it mean if we abolish the last meaningful venue to shame people into shaping up without the power of without the power of government behind it. If we move away from this model, are we admitting that private codes of conduct are totally meaningless in the internet age? No, and again, going back to social enforcement, okay? I do not believe, for instance, it will be a dark day when the government gets the power to tell you how unhealthy you are and at the point of a gun can tell you to lose weight or live a specific lifestyle. Now. Although there are many lifestyle choices that are bad, I smoke cigarettes. That is a bad lifestyle choice on my part. There are health ramifications for this, right? It's not a good thing for me to do, but I do do it, okay? Other people that I know wolf down a lot of bad fast food all the time. They have a lot of health issues, okay? They're constantly going to the doctor's offices for a lot of these health issues, all right? Again, at the point of a gun, the government should not have the ability to tell you how to live your life. Now, nobody else should have to pick up the tab for what you do, with maybe the exception of next of kin, right? Which is why you, as a family member and as a friend, should socially enforce to the people that you care about and that you love, like, hey, guess what? Your bad choices are gonna fall onto me and I'm gonna have to pay for them. So if you wanna be a grade A a-hole, you can absolutely keep living the life that you're living, but I would really like to not have to pick up your hospital bills when you die. Probably one reason why I should quit smoking, okay? If we move away from this model, are we admitting that private codes of conduct are totally meaningless in the internet age? No, and the reason that private codes of conduct are not totally meaningless in the internet age is because a code of conduct should start with yourself, the individual, where all rights begin. Not with the collective, not with the public group, with you. 
Your private code of conduct is never meaningless as long as you are putting a code of conduct on your actions and your language right? It's why there are a lot of things out there. Although I believe, and I spoke about this, free speech has its limits, right? Speech cr speech will eventually cross a line, right? And it is so extraneous, right? When it crosses that line. Again, we're getting into defamation. We're getting into uh, uh, some other rare instances that have happened in court cases in the past. But speech can cross a line, but it takes a lot for speech to cross the line into something that is actually harmful. Not this crap that they talk about online, okay? When somebody can most likely easily avoid the harm or people can easily get away from the words that people are saying, generally it's like, well, why didn't you leave the area? And well, if you chose not to get away from that person, you chose to stay there and take the abuse that you are claiming that they gave to you using words, okay? When it comes to the internet age and the codes of conduct, they start with you. You have the codes of conduct, right? You tell the people who associate with you. If you are to engage with me as a friend, as a colleague, as just a person that I will talk to as a family member, these are the codes of conduct in which I am doing my best to live. Sometimes I fail, but these are the codes of conduct I live with. And if you are to interact with me and engage with me, you will also follow these codes of conduct. And that is where the private codes of conduct happen, okay? Enforce them in your life, even with people that you engage with online. So no, they are not meaningless in any way. If the internet is a public square, is it susceptible to the same rules as other public squares? I know uh, many of the people who strongly advocate for preserving anonymity online also insist that places like Twitter and Facebook are public squares. Yet a large number of masked screaming people on Twitter is free speech and a large number of masked screaming people on the street is a mob. Um, no. A large number of masked screaming people on the street is free speech. As long as they do not engage in violent behavior, okay? As long as they do not actually go from just sitting there yelling at the top of their lungs to beating the crap out of people, okay? Again, I've been to many protests in my life. I've been to, you know, many gatherings, you know, pro-life assemblies. I've been to, you know, uh, um, free speech assemblies, things like that. A lot of people there. A lot of people, you know, dressed kind of funny. I don't care if you're wearing a mask in public as long as you're not beating the crap out of somebody doing it. Now, that could go for people who don't have masks. Again, yelling and screaming in the street, even with a group of people, is not a mob, okay? A mob is a group of people that gets violent and in order to stop other people, takes that violence to the extreme, okay? So I would say this, you're conflating two separate things here, Horizon. And again, I'm not going after you. I actually really like a lot of your points here and I'm very glad that you decided to make all of these. And if you're seeing a lot of people not being able to make these distinctions, it's because they're not thinking about the issue. Again, when people are typing on their keyboards online, using in being anonymous online, typing things so they can shout at people online. It's the same thing as people with a mask yelling at people in a protest on the street that they disagree with. It changes once it becomes violent, okay? Once, again, you can swing your fists all day long, but your right to swing your fists ends when it connects with my face. Now, that's where your rights stop. Your rights end where my rights end, right? Your rights end where my rights begin. My rights end where your rights begin. That's where it is, okay? So no, there, there's a conflation there that I'm not quite sure how people are getting to. Again, it, it almost seems like you're conflating speech and action, and maybe that's just because you've engaged with a lot of people online who are engaging in speech and then obviously we see all the rhetoric online but again as long as people are not touching another person not engaging in violence they're not a mob if i have to use social media to do all my business collaborations is it acceptable that i also have to run 
uh, the gauntlet of mass people who will run up and try to ruin my reputation anytime I try to build up a new business relationship. That completely depends. Are they being defamatory? Okay. Is their speech that they are using, are they using it against you in a way that is a confirmed lie, right? That is a confirmed lie in order to hurt your reputation and something that you can prove in a court of law at the very least to just clear your reputation. All right, now, if these masked people are running up and saying, hey, did you happen to know that Horizon Talker was involved in this really heinous thing and it could potentially be harmful for your business and Horizon Talker was actually involved in this thing that if word got out could hurt this other business? Is that defamation? No, it is not. Now, there could be a whole slew of other things out there that could, Horizon Talker could say, hey, you know, I had a bad... And I'm just, Horizon, I'm just using you because you, you made the comments. So again, not going after you. I'm just using you. Let's use me, right? Let's just say somebody says, hey, did you know that Royce from A Drink With Crazy engaged in heinous things when he was younger and so on and so forth, right? And then I say, okay, here's the thing. When I was younger, I absolutely did do this, but I've turned my life around. And in fact, I've done a lot of other good things. And then they come back and they say, did you know he did it last week and he hasn't reformed? And I go, uh, block. Uh, again, there are things out there. There's a whole context to this. Are they being defamatory when they run up and they are, again, if they're being defamatory, that is wrong. If they are not being defamatory and they are being truthful, that's free speech. Okay. If every sign I put up on the street is surrounded by hundreds of people who decide they must block my advertisements from ever being seen, is that speech or an active campaign to harm me? That is completely dependent on how you and your town have voted maybe on the laws in your town, right? If you say, look, you are allowed to protest a business. You are not allowed, however, to block entry to that business or even threaten people who are going into that business there are rules like that there are laws like that do that do exist they're not highly enforced much anymore because well we can see what's online but again people saying we don't like what this business does again I have been outside of Planned Parenthood and I have prayed the rosary and we have handed out pamphlets to people who were there. We did not say, we just said here, if you think you need another option, here's a pamphlet. Well, most of the time, we didn't even stop the people from going inside. All we did was say, look, there's another option if this isn't the one for you. We were not actively engaged in trying to harm the people going into the business or trying to really even stop people. And I would argue that people should be stopped from going into Planned Parenthood. But the fact of the matter is, is violence doesn't solve anything, especially in the day and age. Kindness is what you should go for. <clears throat> we have laws about obstructing businesses in uh, the physical public square. Do we need them in the digital one as well? We have those laws, okay? Those laws are around defamation. Again, defamation, libel, slander, all of these things, they do exist and you can use them, okay? They already exist. We do not need more laws on the books. We do not need our government to do more, to try to write another thing that criminalizes more people. We already have the necessary infrastructure to do what you are talking about and to appropriately handle the internet. The problem is, is that instead of the politicians going back and saying, we already have laws to deal with it, we're just going to use this. They say, we're going to write a new bill, a new act. And then they write a 17,432 page bill that they decide. I'm just pulling that number out of nowhere. And they sneak a whole bunch of other things in. Okay. Anytime you ask the government to do something like this, they will do tenfold more than you expect and in ways that you did not expect. That is why we should use the laws we already have on the books. Conversely, if a public, if it's a public square, can we demand some kind of identification of people to use it? You do not demand identification from people in a public square. In fact, there are very few places that do. Okay, 
public buildings, such as, our, and by public buildings, I mean courthouses, federal buildings, DMVs, things of that nature, okay? Oh, oh, I apologize. It's so very dry out here right now, okay? You do not demand of people identification to simply walk outside of your house. That crosses into the line of papers, please, which they have tried to do, okay? You should not, with a mask or without a mask, have to provide papers of simply walking down the street and talking with other people, okay? In most cases, we can't in the real world. I disagree. I disagree. I can walk down to the park with my kids and not have to show identification. In fact, I can walk into many restaurants and not have to show identification. Now, if I want to consume alcohol, I need to show identification because our governments have decided that there's a specific age range on people who should and should not consume alcoholic beverages. I may disagree with those rules, but them's the rules. And in those cases, I have to do it. If I go in and I want to vote, I should have to show my ID. If I want to go and I want to register my my vehicle for legal reasons to make sure that I do in fact own that vehicle and I am the rightful owner of that vehicle. I do have to show my ID, but to simply walk down the street and walk with people who happen to agree with you politically is not something you have ever had to show identification for. Do not conflate these issues. You're talking about a lot of, of you're talking about a lot of things that have already been parsed out through the legal system and through many court cases throughout the country, okay? In most cases, we can't in the real world. Again, I that's wrong. In most cases, you can in the real world, okay? Um, is it right to act like Elon Musk uh, and amplify... Uh, is it right to act like Elon Musk? Okay, okay. Is it right to act like Elon Musk and amplify people who are willing to identify themselves but keep anonymous voices limited to their personal circles? Why not? Do I not have a right to go on and shout out people like maybe 365 Inf Infantry, who I have shouted out? Maybe going out and shouting guys like my co-host on Friday nights, IronAge.media. You know, how about talking pulp press people who use pseudonyms online? Now their real names are out there and that's fine. But why am I not allowed to amplify any anonymous voice that I want to for any reason that I want to, as long as that reason is not done to harm another person or to keep another person from engaging in their rights? Again, there's a larger issue here. We're conflating multiple things together, and you have to deal with each of these issues separately. Use of the public square doesn't put the volume knob in the hands of others, and in most cases, when public or private bodies try to grab the volume knob, we can stop them. Uh, potentially, and no, the public square has always had a volume knob, and generally what it is, is it's the gathering of people. Usually the person who is the most outlandish or makes the most sense, <clears throat> right? Usually it's the person who is, you know, the biggest genius in the room or the person who is the biggest crazy in the room get the attention, right? You know, the broken tile always stands out. The obviously, you know, the nail that sticks out gets the hammer. Kind of a similar situation here. The people who are talking in ways that are different than the normal masses usually get the most attention. I mean, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. I mean, come on. These people were out there. You know, Rosa Parks got a hell of a volume knob, and it was the people who surrounded themselves and said, this is what we want to do, okay? We can go back throughout history and find that the volume knob is us, the people, and who we choose to boost ourselves, okay? Is it fair to exert that kind of control over publishing venues uh, built or acquired by people after decades of work? I think that, honestly, if, if we had more of a free market, more of a capitalistic society, and capitalism is can't exist without a moral foundation. If you know anything about Adam Smith, you would know that Adam Smith was a moral philosopher and not necessarily an economist, right? 
However, if we would like to have a free market, which we do not have in this country, we did in any stretch of the imagination, lobbying and lobbying is a huge thing in this country. And we generally have a harder time. Okay, so we can't actually do what you're talking about. Is it fair to exert that kind of control over publishing venues uh, built or acquired by people after decades of work? I would say that uh, if you feel that somebody deserves your attention and your voice to shout out what they are doing, absolutely go for it. We do have enough, at least that much of a free market, okay? Can we really take their hands off the controls at gunpoint and call that good? Nobody should ever be going after things like this at gunpoint. And in fact, that is what the government does and has done for ever. <laughs> like, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I apologize again, getting over this cold and it just doesn't seem to want to go away. Okay. This is why we do not want to create more laws or ask that more laws be created. We already have the laws on the books that can deal with many of the things that you're referencing. Maybe in some situation, but in this one, yes, I have the right to amplify anybody that I want to, okay? Is it fair to exert the kind of control of publishing venues built or acquired by people after decades of work? If I feel that they deserve that voice. Yes, I am going to exert my control over my freedom of speech to announce and shout out to people. Again, just because Elon Musk happens to have a lot of money and a lot of people pay attention to him doesn't mean that he's necessarily a bad guy or an evil person or anything of that nature. Okay, And this only scratches the surface of all the questions I have about anonymity and online interactions. Adding a quantum element where we are, uh, where we are both uh, anonymous and publicly known individuals to the mix only adds to the confusion. And I think ranting about it rather than trying uh, to build solid answers to any of these questions uh, just prolongs the amount of time we'll spend frustrated and angry over it. Just my two cents, however. Well, Horizon Talker. Let me give you my final points on this issue. Most of the things that you brought up here already has a legal infrastructure to deal with it, okay? The problem is, is that one, when you get in, when you start getting public figures who are in the government, right? Senators, House members, House representatives, and all that. The only reason that these people say, we need to write more laws to deal with this. It's not because we don't already have laws on the books that have the precedent to deal with this and that we can apply to these situations it's legitimately because we never write bills that have to deal with one issue anymore we write these huge omnibus packages especially on the federal level that deal with a plethora of issues that most people have no idea about okay again this is the only reason that politicians say we should pass more laws Again, all of the issues that you have identified here, there is a legal infrastructure, at least in the United States, to deal with most of this, okay? Most, if not all. I would argue all, but again, not having the entire library of court precedent that's been set in this country, in my mind right now, there are some really good lawyers out there that may may have I just, I, and I'm just a plethora of knowledge on that subject. I would argue that we can probably deal with all of these issues online that we're talking about with what's already been done, okay? The idea that we as human beings are doing anything new is preposterous. The internet is just the modern day letter. That's all it is, okay? The internet is the modern day letter. It's just the modern day phone line. It's the modern day stone in which you carve out your story on. We already have things in place to deal with these issues. And most people try to conflate issues together. And that's where people think things are complicated, such as the one thing that you said, the difference between somebody on Twitter shouting anonymously, that's free speech. But all of a sudden, people gathering together in a street shouting is a mob. Well, that's not a mob. A mob engages in violent activity and aggresses upon other people. 
But people who simply want to wear masks and go out there and shout on the streets and do not harm anybody, that is free speech. So ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think down below when it comes to all of these issues versus free speech versus anonymity online versus, oh, I don't know, any other thing that you think could cross the free speech threshold, the public square, the Twitters, the Facebooks, you know, what Pokemon said with wanting to make things illegal, you know, for actions that people take online. She didn't say doxing, but a lot, some people who wanted to defend her came on my channel and said doxing. All right. Where do you draw the line for your personal free speech? Because ultimately that is the only way to control free speech for yourself. You control what you say and how you act. And at no point should the federal government be given the power at the point of a gun to stop you from saying anything that does not lead to the restriction of rights of your fellow man. You are allowed to say whatever you want, however you want, as long as what you say and when you say it and how you say it is not done for the intentional harm of another human being in the form of a lie. So ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think. This is definitely a longer video than I usually do. But I felt that this was very important. Horizon Talker, thank you so much for commenting. You absolutely had a lot of good points here, and there are a lot of things to deal with here. Hopefully, I was able to explain my points as much as I could. I wanted to make sure to let people know in this video that a lot of the things I'm talking about are not complex, complicated issues. They're all individual issues that people are trying to mash together as one issue, and that's where people tend to overcomplicate the situation, right? These are individual things that we can deal with individually. A lot of people, well, what if people do both of them at the same time? Okay, we handle this issue here, and then you handle this issue here, right? These are individual things that we have dealt with, we know how to deal with, we have precedent to deal with, and most people don't want to deal with them. All they want to do is slap people down and say, govern me harder, daddy, point your gun at that person because I don't like them, and go bang, bang, and then they shut up. Remember, that's what the government wants to do. That's what a lot of people want the government to do, and I absolutely refuse to allow the government any more power and any more authority to take their guns and point them at anybody else. Ultimately, free speech needs to rule the day and not the barrel of the guns that our governments wield. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking out this video. I know it's a little bit of a long one, but I felt that all of this was really important to get to. If you guys like what I am doing here on the channel, or if you have a comment that you would like me to read, make sure to comment down below and let me know your thoughts on this, and then join me at 11 a.m. Central every single Sunday. Okay, 11 a.m. Central every single Sunday. I do Sunday coffee. Sunday coffee, oh my good lord, reading your comments. And I go through and I read all of your comments that you leave on the channel. Now, Horizon Talker had a little bit of a special episode here, so I won't be reading his on Sundays, but I will be referencing this next Sunday, and I will be telling everybody to come back to this video. And if you guys also are tired of what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing, what the DC Cinematic Universe is doing, what Marvel and DC Comics have been doing, and overall the trash garbage leftist, you know, fourth great religion storytelling that Hollywood has been doing, don't forget to join me here on the channel with my co-hosts, IronAge.media and Mr. Daniel P. Riley, on Friday nights at 8 p.m. Central, where we bring on writers, authors, movie directors, and, well, comic book writers, and just tons of people. We're bringing on the people that are writing the new stories, creating the new things, and making sure that we build culture in the future. So thank you all so much for checking out this rather long-winded video. And I look forward to seeing you all next time right here. Cheers, everybody.
Thank you all for being here on A Drink With Crazy. If you guys never want to miss a notification for the channel, go down in the link in the description and click that button to follow me and support me over on Locals. It's free to join, but that's where you can support me with money if you so choose. Also, don't forget to click those Rumble and Odyssey links so that way we can get over there and keep that growing. And until next time, cheers, everybody.